Hare Krishna. So we are discussing the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita and this chapter comes um, as a follow up to the previous chapter where Krishna has said that I sustain the whole universe and before Arjuna starts Arjuna speaks a verse which indicates something quite significant. So let's see what he's saying. Mat anugrahaya paramam. Anugraha is mercy. You have had great mercy on me. In fact, supreme mercy. Mat anugrahaya paramam. And what is this mercy? Guhiyam. Guhiyam, that is just confidential, adhyatma sangeetam, spiritual knowledge, that which is rich with spiritual knowledge. You have shared that with me. And guhiyam adhyatma sangeetam. And what happens by this? It is not just that the knowledge is special, the effect of that knowledge on me is also special. Yat tvayoktam. These words, tvaya uktam, which have been spoken by you. Vachas tena. So these words just spoken by you, you to be what happens? Yatvayoktam vachastena. Yatvayoktam vachastena. Mohoyam. That my, this illusion of mine. Vigato mama. So he says my illusion has been dispelled. Mohoyam vigato mama. Mohoyam vigato mama. So together. Arjuna vacha. Madanigraha. Paramam. So, if you look at the words, what it means in one sense is that the Gita conversation is over. Because he is saying that you have been merciful to me and my illusion is dispelled. The whole purpose of the Gita was to have Arjuna's illusion dispelled, isn't it? And in one sense, just before this also Krishna, uh, Arjuna has declared that Krishna accepts you as a supreme person. Param Brahma Param Dhamma. He has said that and even more now, he is saying that my moha is gone. So in one sense, if we consider the Gita as a Class followed by a question answer session. <coughs> this color visible. So, if we consider the Gita is like a main class, and by 1042 it's over, and after that, what follows are the post class questions. So, there are some questions inside the class like if the speaker makes some points and the audience may ask some questions about those points but then after the class gets over then there are what you could call as miscellaneous questions so now the miscellaneous questions may be related with what the speaker has spoken they may not be related with what the speaker has spoken but the overall point is that these are questions that are being asked because Arjuna is interested in knowing more. So if his moha is gone, then we could say the Gita could be over and he could start fighting. But he asks some extra questions. So he is saying that you have been merciful to me, you have freed me from illusion. And if you consider this particular verse, moho yam vigato mama. This is very similar to the verse at the end of the Gita, Nashto Moha Sukhiyamda. And here also it's Madhu Anugrahaya Paramam, there it is. Tat Prasada Anmayachuta. So Prasada and Anugraha are similar words. Nashta Moha and Vigata Moha are similar words. So basically, in many ways, there is a striking similarity between 11.1 and 1873. There is so that 1873 is the, la, is the last word that is spoken by Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. 
So there it is Nashta Moha. Here it is Vigata Moha. There it is Prasad Prasadan. It's Prasad. Prasad is mercy. And here it is Anugraha. Now the key difference over there is there it's clearly the end means Karishe Vachnam Tama. He says, I'll do your will. Here he says, I have few more questions. It's like a doctor has diagnosed and given some I uh, given and has given some outline of the treatment. The patient says, okay, I have some more questions now. So like that he's asking some questions over here. And the question that he asks is about Krishna's Vishwarupa. So he asks, Let's just say this. Manya se yadi tachakyam. Manya se yadi tachakyam. If it is possible. Chakya means possible. Manya says if you consider. If you consider that it is possible. What is possible? Maya drashtum. That I can see. Iti prabho. Oh Lord. Oh Master. Maya drashtum iti prabho. Maya drashtum iti prabho. Yogeshwara tatomitam. So Yogeshwara. You are the. Lord of all yoga and yogis. Tato, therefore, may tuam unto me, Darshayatma Namavayam. Please show me that imperishable form. Atma Namavayam. Your imperishable form. Your. In the previous verse, he says, and I want, to, I want to see here that universal form by which you pervade all of existence. Yogeshwara Tato, may tuam. Darshayatma Namavayam. So here, what is happening? Man, he is expressing his humility. Manya said, if it is possible for you. So you know, in bhakti, there is a thin line. Devotion is very much about desiring. If a devotee does not have the desire to see the Lord. But devotee does not have the desire to hear about the Lord. If a devotee does not have the desire to serve the Lord, then there is no devotion. It like say some a boy says to girl, I love you. But I don't mind if we don't meet for the next 25 years. <laughs> there, <laughs> there is no love over me, isn't it? So if there is devotion, then actually it's a love. Devotion is the purest form of love. So devotion is there, desiring has to be there. But at the same time, there should not be demanding. Because he is our Lord and we are meant to serve him. So in devotion, there has to be desiring but not demanding. So now if there is no desiring, there is no devotion. If there is demanding, then there is no service. Is it no service attitude? We need to have a certain no, no devotion, no affection. So we need both. Uh, desire, we, have, we want to have the desires, but at the same time, we don't want to make demands. So desiring, but not demanding. Mm -hmm. Some people don't just make demands from God, they give ultimatums to God. If you don't fulfill the desire, I'll stop believing in you. <laughs> so, <laughs> they try to blackmail God. It doesn't work like that, you know. Mm -hmm. But here Arjuna is saying that if it is possible for you, Lord, please show me your Now, Krishna is actually an expert teacher. Now, what do you mean by an expert teacher? It, we can see the expertise of the teacher by many things. One of the things is their delivery of the subject, delivery of content. But what shows much more their, uh, their expertise is the capacity to answer questions. Because anybody can script a brilliant talk, not anybody, but some people can just script a brilliant talk. You can plan, I'll speak this point, I'll speak this point, I'll speak this point. Can even plan at this point, I'll make this joke and you'll have humor. So people will laugh and you can plan everything like that. But you can't really plan question answers. 
unless of course you plant people and only you got <laughs> only let those people ask questions <laughs> but uh, so what kind of questions people will ask and how will the person be able to answer the questions that actually shows the mastery of the person now one challenge that comes is um, that people may ask questions that are disconnected now when there are disconnected questions the tangential questions they are disconnected or we could say they are tangential you know the word tangential like a circle moves in a particular way a tangent goes away from that so like tangential questions means they are related to the subject but you can say everything is related with everything in this book so anything can be connected with anything but the questions are not really going with the flow of the subject so at that time teachers were not very expert they can go in two directions one is they just refuse to answer now if they refuse to answer what happens is the audience feels dissatisfied Oh, I had a question. I didn't get an answer to the question. So, as in Australia, when I 2014 first time I went to Australia, I gave some classes there to Australians. Most of our temple had a lot of Indians, but this is an Aussie program. And there, the organizer told me that if anyone asks questions, <coughs> answer that question immediately. Don't say that you will get the answer at the end of the class. If anybody raises raises their hands, let them speak. Say. Oh, why is that? He said, want to disrupt the flow. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, these people, they are very laid back kind of people. They hardly ever ask any questions. <laughs> and if one of them asks a the question and if you don't answer, then after that, not only that person, nobody else will ask a question. So, I said, really? Australians are laid back people. My impression about Australia is from cricket. <laughs> In cricket, they are very aggressive. They sledge and they are, they are, but they say yes. In sports, Aussies are aggressive. In real life, they are very laid back. So, okay, so but the point is that is that you, if you somebody is asking a question, neglecting the question is not a great idea. But the other thing we could do is you go off on a tangent because the question is a tangential question. You also go off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> now the problem with this is that the subject is not covered hmm? and then those who came for the subject again audience is dissatisfied that person may be satisfied but the rest of the audience is dissatisfied you know hey you went off in some other direction only I came for one class and you gave some other topic only. so the real expert is they answer the question in such a way that you reconnect with the subject now that really requires expertise how can we reconnect with the subject after answering the question so now this is what Arjuna will do in this chapter is Arjuna do? Yes, Krishna. So Arjuna asked the question, and Krishna could have said, Hey, you want to see my universal form? What do you think? Are you thinking on a sightseeing mission over here? Hey, uh, we don't have time. A war is going to happen over here. Everybody is waiting. So Krishna could have refused to answer. But Krishna says, Okay, I will answer. I will show you this. But I will show you something more. So that something more. If you do. So here he says, yes. In this place, he said, yet chanyat drashtu michasi. So what you desire to see, drashtu michasi. What you desire to see, I'll show you. Manne se he says, you know, can drashtu michami te rupam. I want to see your form. So he said, drashtu michasi. I'll show you that, but something else I'll show you. And that something else is what is the key to linking the subject back to the, the question, back to the core subject. 
Now, what is the core subject of the Bhagavad Gita? Sorry? Free from <coughs> yes, free from lamentation. That is, that is, yeah, we can understand from the way the Gita begins and ends. But specifically, oh yes, yeah. What should Arjuna do? What is the right thing for him to do? So should he, he should fight. That's what we know from there. But basically, it is what is the right thing to do. So that is that is basically that means the Gita's whole central focus is in deciding or pointing towards action so krishna will show this will offer this revelation but from their revel that revelation he will bring it back to the edge so now krishna says that actually you cannot see what i am going to show you therefore i will give you divyam dadamite chakshu divyam dadamite chakshu the chakshu is eyes divyam is divine so i will give you special eyes by which you can see this so generally speaking whenever any extraordinary vision occurs so we have that we exist in the material world we exist in the material world and here we can only see material things and krishna exists in the spiritual world so now <coughs> when people have some special vision there are broadly two possibilities see krishna himself comes over here and then he gives vision to everyone like when he came as an avatar everybody saw krishna Now, of course, not everybody accepted that Krishna is God, but everybody saw Krishna. But the other possibility is that that person is given a special vision. So it's like nowadays there are this what is Apple Vision or is AI Vision kind of thing. So why you put on some goggles and you see some beautiful company? So. <coughs> So basically, here when Krishna shows his universal form, which among these two is happening? Special Second one. Yes, it is not that everybody there saw the universal form. Krishna showed it to in the middle of the battlefield, but it was he gave a special vision to us. Divyam Dhamvi Echakshu. Does he specifically had a desire, and then he showed him that form. Now. we will go a little ahead to look at the universal form but before we do that this this divine eyes what does it mean literally that see many people think that we see with our eyes well yes and no why because the word see can mean vision but see can also mean comprehension isn't it like say a, a guest is coming to our place and they are not able to locate our place so we go out and we there on phone there on phone and they say oh i see you like at the airport we are at the airport and we go to pick up and see means there we are looking at vision but if we are having a discussion with someone and then he say i see your point Now that doesn't mean that they have drawn some point or some white board. We see that point, isn't it? Or not something invisibly floating somewhere and we see it. So there we use the word "see" in a non-literal sense. "See" means I see your point. I, mean, I get what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. So the word "see" can be vision or it can be comprehension. And the difference between the two is a common theme in the scriptures. There are many places where Krishna says, "Yah pashyati sabashya." One who sees this way is actually sees. Or pashyan api na pashyan. They see, but they don't see. What it means is that they are, they may have the vision. The visual data is entering into their eyes, but nothing is registering in their intelligence. So. one who sees in this way actually see that means 
that the, the data is going in their eyes, but then intelligence is also competent. So actually we see both with our eyes and our intelligence. We need we need actually both of them to be able to properly see. So yaha pashyati. Sa pashyati. One who sees in this way actually sees. Seems like that come many times in the Gita. As in the Bhagavad. So why are we discussing this over here? That the universal form is such an extraordinary vision. It's so it's going to be such a complex, awe-inspiring and overwhelming vision that Krishna gives a advanced description of what he's going to say. So now if somebody is going to you know somebody is working in a very advanced lab. There are all kinds of instruments over there, all kinds of high-tech equipment in there. And they will take us over there. They may say, okay, okay. Before we enter there, these are things that you're going to see over there. You will see this, you will see this. Because there you might just be overwhelmed by all the circuits and all the gadgets and all the machines. So it's a very interesting descriptive format that is used in the Gita. Because this is such an extraordinary vision. So what happens is that 5 to 8, that is Krishna's self-description. There is Krishna who is disconnected. So it's gone again. Okay. So 5 to 8 is Krishna's self-description. That this is original what I'm going to say, show you. Then 10 to 13 is Sanjay's description to whom? Dhritarashtra. And then after that 15 to 31 is Arjuna's description. This is what I am seeing. So the idea is that this is an extraordinary vision that the Gita is helping us see it from different people's perspectives. Like, you know, if say, say we are not able to go for some yatra and there, there's some wonderful experiences. Then we may ask, how was the yatra? And they will describe something. And we ask another, how was the yatra? And they will describe something. Yes, third devotee. So what we are trying to do is, from multiple people's disruptions, we are trying to get a clearer and clearer picture of what's happening. Generally speaking, it's very rare that one person can describe everything exhaustively. And this is a fundamental principle to understand conflict resolution. <laughs> that you know there is there is my side of the story and there is your side of the story. And then there is the story. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the story is very, very difficult to know what actually happened. We can try to piece it together. But actually, many times if you try to conflict resolution, the first thing you have to do is you have to become like a detective. You know, okay, this is what this person is saying, this is what this person is saying. What exactly happened? So, but getting multiple perspectives helps us understand things better. Now, if we had time, we could go into some differences in what Sanjay is, what Krishna describes, what Sanjay describes and what Arjuna describes. And they are very telling differences. Telling means very significant differences. But the key point is that Krishna, the key one key point Krishna says, I am going to show you something else. Because Krishna is the boss, it is he who is showing everything. So the key point he says is, I am going to show you something extra. And in any book, if there is a novel or there is a drama, there is a movie or a drama, this is called as foretelling. Foretelling means what happens? Say if two people come into a room and then we are showing a shown view of the room and then suddenly the camera shows, hey, there's a gun over there on that shelf. Now if they show the gun, then after that something should happen with that gun. Maybe somebody shoots with that gun or at least uses the gun to threaten someone. Otherwise it's just a distraction. So foretelling means that what is going to happen later 
that is foretold. So in Krishna's description, what is there? There is the foretelling. Anyad. I'm going to show you something more. Now, in Sanjay's description, what Sanjay does is he says that this description is like Divisurya Sahasrasya. He says this is like Sahasra is how much? Thousand. So this is like thousands of suns. Now Arjuna will say Durniriksham Samanta. It's very difficult to see. So, but he doesn't say it's that impressive, that blazing. So basically, how it happens is that for Sanjay who is seeing it, he just sees how how blazing it is. Now for Arjuna and Krishna reveal the universal form, it is there can be there is blindness can be caused by two things one is darkness and also by brightness isn't it like sometimes when you are driving a car if you are driving a car and some truck driver comes from the opposite side and they suddenly increase the uh, the luminosity the light of their car There's, the glare comes in and then we can be blinded because of the glare so brightness can also be blinding and that's what the issue which they talk about it, that that the brightness of your Brahman is so much that it's blinding. So Krishna is going to show the form to Arjuna, but he doesn't want Arjuna to be blinded. So for Krishna, Arjuna's vision, the blindness is not shown to be so. Sorry, the brightness is not shown to be so much. So it's difficult to see, but it's not impossible. Sometimes, then. Uh, in, a, in some movie, if a battle is happening in the night, then they may want to have it realistic. It's dark. But if it's so dark that nobody can see what is happening, then that defeats the purpose. So, basically the lighting has to be adjusted so that it is not bright like, bright like the day, but it is not completely dark like the night. Otherwise, there is no enjoyment. What is happening over there? Um, so, similarly, what Krishna does is, Krishna, he adjusts the brightness over here <laughs> so so that arjuna does not find it to be so bright now in arjuna's description there are many things which are special but the key thing is arjuna's emotions are described so krishna just gives a description this is what i'm going to show sanjay also says oh this is what is being shown and he also expects some, something like yogesh what is this that that Yogeshwar Lord is showing it, but Arjuna's emotions are described, and that is what is very significant in this. But let's look at a few verses uh, from what Arjuna says. So, as I said here, Divi Surya Sarasrasya. It goes on till 13th verse's description, and then after that, what happens is, for Sanjay is descri describing the universal form. And then he shifts the focus to Arjuna. He says, what is, what is happening to Arjuna? So, it's the second time in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna's hairs are standing on it. When was the first time? In the first chapter. So, now there it is out of fear. Here is it out of fear? Here it is out of astonishment. It is bismitos me. It is amazement. It is delight. So, Tattaha, so Tatahasa Vismay. Vismay is amazement. Avishto. It is a surge of emotion, of astonishment. Tatahasa Vismaya Vishto. Rushtaroma. Rushtaroma is the hair of standing on it. Dhananjaya. That Arjuna, who is the winner of wealth, who has acquired great wealth in the past, but when he gets this, he realizes. There is nothing like this. So the word Dhananjaya is significant that in this that later on they said that that actually no matter how much wealth, austerity, knowledge you have, you cannot see this universal form. It's very rare. So that winner of wealth has now realized hey, that I have got something special. So like somebody who has, has traveled to various beautiful places in the world, maybe they have gone to Mount Everest, they have gone to this rocky mountain, they have gone here, they have gone there. 
and if they go to some beautiful place and oh, their mouth falls open their eyes become wide and that means this must be really beautiful so here the dhananjaya is vishkaroma that that person who has on compass got great wealth that person is stunned that means he is seeing something very special Rishta Roma Dhananjaya Rishta Roma Dhananjaya And then what does he do? Pranamya He folds his hand And then Shirasa Devam He bows down Pranamya Shirasa is actually he bows his head down rather And then Kritanjali That's where he folds his hand Abhashita Abhashita means he starts speaking Pranamya Shirasa Devam Pranamya Shirasa Devam Kritanjali Rabhashita Kritanjali Rabhashita now before we move forward some key points over here that see originally Arjuna is here and say Krishna is here now when we see the pictures we often see that Krishna is pointing over here and then Krishna is showing the whole universal form that is spreading all around coming from Krishna and spreading all around that is how we see the universal form but for Arjuna what happens is when Krishna shows the universal form it is as if Krishna himself disappears. So Arjuna is no longer able to see Krishna. So in the picture that we are showing, it's like two scenes are being depicted simultaneously. So later on, that's when Arjuna has a question. He will not say to Krishna, Krishna, there's no Krishna over there. So he has to ask the universal form only. So Krishna has disappeared for him. And he's only seeing the universal form. And when we see, when he sees the universal form, let's he actually let's see what what does he see, and how does he respond? So he says, "Aneka bahu." Dar, bahu is what arms. Udar is belly. Vaktra, yeah, mouth. Netram, eyes. Aneka bahu dar vaktra netram. Aneka bahu dar vaktra netram. So again, now the, the Pashami had come in the first chapter. So actually there are many similarities in the first chapter and the 11th chapter in terms of the emotion that Arjuna is experiencing and the emphasis on the vision, on seeing. Those two things are similar. So vision and emotion. Pasha, I see Twam, I see you everywhere. First of all he says, I see many hands, many mouths, many arms, many faces, but then Anandarupam, Sarvam. Sarvato Anandarupa, you are not just many, but it's everywhere and your form is actually unlimited. Pashyami Tvam Sarvato Anandarupam Pashyami Tvam Sarvato Anandarupam And then, just to emphasize that Anandarupa, it's just so magnificent. It's like, you know, if we go to some wealthy person's house and you're on their terrace, and they will say that, you know, in all directions, as far as your eye can see, it's all my property. Okay, now that could be said out of ego. It might just be information. And he starts saying there's beautiful greenery. There is rivers. There are trees. And say, it just looks so beautiful. Where does it end? This goes on and on and on. So that Ananda Rupam is such an astonishing thing. Because this Krishna was his friend. And now suddenly that friend is showing the universal form. So that emphasis is Nantam. There is no ending. Namadhyam. No middle and Napunas Tava Adim. Adim is Sadi. So it's just literally everywhere. Sometimes in, in poetry, repetition is done for emphasis. Why did this happen? Why, oh, why did this happen? So that, oh, why, oh, why, that, that repetition comes, that brings some further emphasis. Mm -hmm. So, how are you feeling? Somebody has say, lost a loud one. He asks, how are you feeling? I am feeling alone. I am feeling utterly alone. I am feeling alone, utterly alone. All, all alone. What happens is when the repetition comes, the emotion becomes deeper. So sometimes the repetition, maybe you are using the same word again. Sometimes the repetition may be by using different words. So here the point is, he is saying, that Nantam Namadhyam Napunas Tavadim Nantam Namadhyam Napunas Tavadim And then again, 
Pashyami comes second time. Hmm? He is so first Pashyami again. It's, it's actually is describing the vision. What am I seeing? But the second Pashyami is describing the comprehension. It's like I understand what I'm seeing. I, now when we understand, we may identify. So he says he is identifying Pashyami Vishveshwara that you are the Lord of the universe, but you are manifested as Vishwarupa, the universal form. Pashyami Vishveshwara Vishwarupa. Let's recite it together. So here is the a key point over here is when you saying Pashami. Arjuna is both first he is saying I see is a see vision and then he says comprehension or specifically here identification like somebody we meet after a long time and that person may say do you recognize me so that means we are seeing them but recognition is one more thing so in the first he says in the line B if you consider four lines B is the first Pashyami and the D is the second Pashyami, comprehension, vision and comprehension. Now, here the question comes up, what exactly is the universal form? So, the, now the universal form, it is first of all, at least in the Gita, it is in the Gita, it's a revelation. Now, revelation is top down. That means it's Krishna giving the revelation. In the Bhagavatam, also there's a universal form. The English word is the same universal form. The Sanskrit word that is preferred over there is more Virata Rupa. Hmm? Vishwa Rupa Virata Rupa. But either way, the, this is in the Gita, it is a revelation. In the Bhagavatam, it's more of a conceptualization. Conceptualization means the yogi sits. And, and envisions, conceptualizes. Oh, like the mountains are like the bones of the Lord. The rivers are like the, the large lakes are like the water in his navel. So that is more of a bottom up kind of thing. It's a tool that is used to, con to get a sense of the greatness of the Lord. Now the two need not be completely different, but the mode of approaching is different. So here, this is a revelation means it's a krupa. Whereas conceptualization means it's a sadhana. That the focus is here as an exercise, as a practice to understand the greatness of the Lord, one may sit down and visualize. But Arjuna is not visualizing, Arjuna is being given a vision. So that is a key difference. But beyond that, when we say what exactly is the universal form? So now is there in the universe any place of Vishwa Rupa Loka? There is no such thing, there are 14 planetary systems. There is no 15 planetary systems which are Vishwa Rupa Loka. Now of course it is said that a form of Vishnu has in the Purish Sukta is described he has hundreds of hands and hundreds of legs. But that is still the form of Vishnu. And he manifests that form sometimes. It's not the same, in one sense it's the same as Vishwarupa. But Vishwarupa is basically, it's a vision of two things. Of how the universe is the body of God. That's the literal meaning. That the universe is the body of God. So we all have a particular body. And the Lord has a particular body. So that is conveyed through the through the two words that are there in this verse, Vishveshwara, Vishwarupa. So now this repetition of the Lord's relationship with the Vishwa that comes many times in the Bhagavatam. For example, Kunti Maharani in the prayers will say, Atha Vishveshwa Vishwatman Vishwa Murte Swa Keshume. So she says that you are the Vishvesh, same prayer Vishveshwara. 
अथवा विश्वेश विश्वात्मन यू आर द सोल ऑफ द यूनिवर्स एंड विश्व रूप में विश्व मूर्ति यू हैव टेकन ऑन द फॉर्म ऑफ द यूनिवर्स द यूनिवर्स इज योर बॉडी सो इट इज अ विजन ऑफ यूनिवर्स एज द बॉडी ऑफ द लॉर्ड now that is the literal meaning so the vision is given that it is like this form is shown and within this form there are multiple things that are revealed first is that if the universe is the body of god what that means is that literally everything is contained in god that everything is within the power of god everything is the with the controllership of god that god's form extends everywhere and it extends everywhere and everything is within his containment within his controllership so now at different times in the universal form specific contents that are shown may be different so when the idea of the universal the universal form was shown to duryodhan it was shown to tang rishi it was shown to yashoda mai but the specifics of what was shown within the universal form may be different the principle is that actually essentially it is a it is a vision of how god's power extends all across the universe like if it's my body then i can do whatever i want with my body If something is on my body, I can. Pick, if something is in my pocket, I can give it put it somewhere here. So the basic idea is everything is contained in God. Everything is controlled by God. That extent of the power of God. Now it is. There are many aspects of this. When we talk of God and His relationship with nature, there are many aspects of that relationship. So God, at one level, is the source of nature. Aham sarvasya prabhu, as it is said, he is not the source of nature; he is the sustainer of nature. Sustainer means it is he who maintains. Matta sarvam pravartte. Everything is sustained by me. Everything is maintained by me. Now, now, like a person may live in America and they may have a company in India. They are funding the company, but they are not there. Now, with respect to the universe, it's not God is not the source; He is not the sustainer. He is also the pervader. Pervader means He is present throughout the universe. That so, so is not just like a like a boss who sits in one place and provides finances and things to the company. He pervades the pervader. Now, not only is He the pervader, He is also the container. Container means everything is present within. So pervade and contain in one sense they are opposite senses. Pervade is more like he is inside it, and contain means it is inside him. So this same will come in yo ma pashyati sarvatra sarvam chamai pashyat yo ma pashyati sarvatra one who sees me in everything and everything in me. So pervade is inside everything. and container is everything is inside him so this is the god who is present in everything and in whom everything is present that is what is the issue of the verse tad antarasya sarvasya tadu sarvasyasya bahyatah that you are inside everything you are also outside everything so this is that the multiple aspects of the relationship with the lord of nature now in this particular aspect which which vision has been described among all these relationships everything is yes primarily the last one the universal form is primarily about depicting this particular vision okay, well, it's not it is this particular vision that is depicted through the universal form others may also be depicted but the primary is this one so in one sense for us in the, the bhagavatam is the example that, that like we are all within the womb of the lord it is the universe to be like the womb then 
Now literally when the lotus flower comes from the belly of Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu, which Vishnu will come from? Garbhodaksha Vishnu. So it comes out from the belly of Garbhodaksha Vishnu. And then from there, Brahmaji comes. And from there, the whole universe comes. So the idea is that the whole universe was initially contained within the womb of the Lord. And from there it comes up. So right now it is important to understand that it's not that Krishna is somewhere far away and we are here. That is one way of looking at it. There is some reality to it. But actually right now everything is within Krishna. That means we are also within Krishna. So in the universal form that Mother Yashoda sees. She sees the Vrindhi of Vrindavan and she also sees herself. And she sees herself looking at Krishna. So it's... Um, Quite an extraordinary vision. And something similar will happen. So initially, Arjuna sees this magnificent form. And he sees it, and his first reaction is awe. Oh. Awe oh means that when we see something huge, something far greater than ourselves, then we are amazed, we are awestruck. Mm -hmm. So initially, Arjuna feels. This is awesome. Now, awesome is uh, a typical teenagerish vocabulary word. You know, they will say, oh, you know, the party was awesome, my college is awesome, my friends are awesome. And what is not awesome is my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep using the same word again and again. But awesome is the whole idea is that it's something spectacular, it's something wonderful. Sometimes as devotees, we may also use the overuse the same word. Oh, the kirtan was ecstatic, the prasad was ecstatic, the, the food was ecstatic, the temple is ecstatic, devotees are ecstatic. Okay, everything is ecstatic, but your vocabulary is static. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, just for your information, you go to America, don't use the word ecstasy in America. <laughs> ecstasy is the name of a very popular drug. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, also, I was, one, I once gave a class, and after that, one boy came to me with a big, bright smile on his face. Prabhu, your class was awful. <laughs> what? <laughs> then I said, oh, what? Okay. Then I said, oh, okay. Can you explain? Then he said, we said this point is so good and that point is so good. And then I was just trying to figure out what is going on. And then afterwards I tried to understand. And you know, he was just learning English. <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted to use which word? Awesome. awesome. <laughs> so he ended up using the word awful. So now what happens is for Arjuna, for Arjuna from verse 15 to around verse 25, what he sees is awesome. From 26, it becomes awful. <laughs> So, initially the emotion is one turn, this smile, but afterwards it becomes terror, not just fear, but become, it becomes terror. So his emotion changes and we'll see why the emotion changes. But Arjuna says that, I'm trying to see this and he says, this is, this is so blazing, I can't see clearly. But then he starts, sometimes if, say if we come from a dark room, suddenly a bright room, our eyes take some time to start adjusting. And after we start adjusting, then we start seeing things. So he says, I see the Vishnu Rupa over here. And I see the entire universe. I see the Devtas. I see, I see Brahmaji at the top. I see the Nagas, the serpents at the bottom of the universe. Uh, I see from the top to the bottom, I see everything in the universe. So, Dhyava Prithivyor Idamantaram. From the earth to the heavens, everything is per pervading. And Drishtva Adbhutam Rupam. It's an Adbhuta Rupa. But here in 20th verse also some hint comes that it is not just Adbhuta in the sense of wonderful, it is also Ugram. 
Ugram means fearsome, scared. Ugram Travedam. And then Lokatrayam Pravetitam. So he says, Pravetitam means it's they are troubled. All the worlds are troubled by this. And Mahatma, great knowing. Seeing this form, so this form is not just a peaceful, gentle, smiling form. What Mother Yashoda saw was just an amazing form. But what Arjuna is seeing is seems to be an angry form. So, you know, generally, if anybody is angry, we are a little concerned. But if some person is an authority, that person gets angry. Then we become a little worried. So, if somebody is a very powerful person, you know, physically powerful, positionally powerful, and that person becomes angry, then we become alarmed. What happened over here? Isn't it? So, here, seeing this universal form, Ugram, in an angry mood, Lokatrayam Pratitam. He says, what I am seeing is, I am seeing the universal form, and I am seeing various beings who are seeing the universal form. And then I am seeing that they are troubled. So, what happens over here is that sometimes, uh, if we see a person, and we don't know that person very well, so maybe we are not able to see and sense their body language. Maybe we are not able to sense their facial expression. But when they are talking, if we see the person next to them, he is looking very tense. He is looking very scared. Then we can understand that, oh, this person must be very angry. Something is wrong over it. So like that, he is seeing the universal form and he is seeing local trium, pravatitam. Everybody is troubled. And then he is saying, that, that while you are observing the Devta Surasanga Vishanti, they are, uh, they are actually entering into you. Let's recite, recite this verse. Ami Hitvam Surasanga Vishanti. Surasanga is all the Devtas, they are, I am seeing them all entering into you. Ami Hitvam Surasanga Vishanti. And as they are entering, now, this is not at this one as being destructive. The destructive part will come a little later. But some of them, they are just seeing Bhita. They are being, they seem to, they seem to be scared. Pranjala Yogunanti. Pranjala. Pranjala means folding hands. Now, they are folding their hands. What was the earlier word we said? What did Arjuna do? Remember that word? Kritanjali. Excellent. So, Kritanjali. Who was that? We should do Gutanjali to you, Pankar. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, Pranjali. So, he says, they are trying to pacify this form by Kechid Bhit. Kechid Bhita Pranjala Yogrananti. Kechid Bhita Pranjala Yogrananti. Grananti means the speaking. What are they speaking? Sasti. Sasti means Shanti, auspiciousness, peaceful. Like we have the swastik. Swastik is a sign of auspicious. Swasti is a It's like a variant of Shanti. Shanti is more like an emotion. Swasti is more like an invocation. And now we are invoking auspiciousness which will bring peacefulness. Swasti Yuktva Maharshi Siddha Sangha. So there are Sura Sangha, the Devtas, but there are also the great sages over there. And they are chanting mantras for peacefulness. Swasti Yuktva Maharshi Siddha Sangha. Swasti Yuktva Maharshi Siddha Sangha. Stuvantitvam, they are offering praises to you. Stutivi Pushkalavi, profusely they are offering prayers to you. So basically this is a vision of not only God as spreading across the universe, but God is being worshipped by the who's who of the universe. So when we say God's power extends everywhere, what could that mean? Say if we say this king's power extends everywhere, that would mean that all the other kings, all the other heads of state, they are all subordinate to this person. So that is what is being shown over here. Stuvanti, did we recite this? Stuvanti Pham Stutivi Pushkalavi. Stuvanti Pham Stutivi Pushkalavi. And then Sura Sangha, all those are listed. Rudra, Aditya, Vasav, all of them are listed. So now, Rupam Mahate, this great form which he says, Drushtva Loka Pravetita Sataham. So there he says, in the earlier verse, 20th verse, he had said that the three worlds are bewildered. Three worlds are, they are troubled. But he says, Tathaham, Aham. 
I am also troubled by sickness. Now what is happening is that vision is not just a distant vision of sickness. Something more is happening over here. Hmm? So then Arjuna says further, Drushtva Hitam. So Nabhas Pusham Deeptam Anekavar. So he's again describing how the universe form is pervading everywhere. But Drushtva Hitam Pravitantaratma. That actually my very being, sometimes the fear is a little superficial, okay, just hear some loud sound. And we may just be scared what happened. But you know, suppose we hear a news that there's an accident in a place where our loud one is there. And then the fear that comes, it's it's like a it's a fear that goes deep into our being. It, 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 it doesn't just chill our some fears chill our blood, some fears chill our bones itself. Just go through the course of Pratandaratma is saying that my, my very core being is being troubled. And Rutim Navinda means that I am just not able to maintain my peacefulness. Shamam Chavishnu. So, why is this happening? He starts seeing something very dangerous. So, what he's, he earlier saw that, the, that these Devtas and the Siddhas. They are troubled by seeing the universal form and they are offering prayers. But then what happens is Arjuna starts seeing the form and he himself gets troubled. And because he starts getting troubled, then he also starts offering prayers. Mm -hmm. So what is happening is Prasida Devesha Jagan So Prasida Devesha. Prasida means be peaceful. The one nice translation of the Lord is of the word Prasida is. Please be pleased with me. So it like proceed. Please be pleased with me. Hmm? So proceed the Devesh. Oh, oh, you who are the Lord of all the gods. So both of these are actually describing the vision that he is seeing. Devesh. He is actually seeing how all the devtas are offering prayers and a subordinate. But he is also seeing that the whole universe is the body of the Lord. So these two describers are very precise. They are actually describing his very vision. They proceed, oh Lord, be ple please be pleased. You who are the God of the gods, you who are the abode of the universe. Now, what is he seeing over here? He is seeing earlier it was just said that oh your your form is itself very blazing. It's very difficult to see. But now he's saying that I am seeing a blazing fire. I'm seeing your ferocious teeth. Damstra Karalan Chate Mukhani I'm seeing Damstra, I see your fear speed coming from your mouth. And Drish Drishtvaiva Kalan Alasan Nibhani So Drishtva, I'm seeing Kala Anal, the fire of time. The fire of cosmic destruction that comes at the end of time. Sunni Bhani, I'm seeing that fire coming out from your mouth. And seeing that Dishona Jane Nalabhe Sharma. So when somebody says, I, I, I don't know the directions, that means I'm just so disoriented. I just don't know. I'm completely lost over it. Labhe Sharma, I cannot keep my peace of mind. And he's saying, well, basically the point is, there seems to be nothing in my control. Because if I don't even know the directions, if I have to run, which direction am I going to run also? Mm -hmm. I can neither stay steady here, nor can I run anywhere. So the Sharma means I cannot be steady here. If I don't know any directions, I don't know anywhere to go. So therefore all that you can do is, my dear Lord, please you become pacified, proceed. So proceed the Devesha Jagan Nivasa. So basically Arjuna's emotion of fear, Pravitita Sathaham. So the first reference comes in 20, but actually it starts from 23. Now what is he seeing that is so scary? So what is he seeing? He actually sees that what is happening in the universal form. It's like say suppose somebody is sitting and they are having a home theater where they have a giant TV and they are watching some movie on the TV and suppose they are told that it's like a rom-com, it's an enjoyable romantic comedy but then as they start watching they find actually the genre has changed, it's a horror movie. 
you know that so something is sweet now becomes scary and maybe there is some fiery monster which is just going around destroying everything and a fire is coming from the mouth and it seems to be destroying everything and then you really get scared and then we see on that tv that monster is coming into our area only <laughs> the in our locality is coming and the fire from the monster is actually destroying all the buildings around our house and then hey this is becoming a little too real and i say i don't want to watch it and you try to turn off the tv and the remote doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> so this for arjuna the what happens afterwards is that he sees this fog and all that fire coming from the mouth he sees that fire is actually destroying everyone in the battlefield itself and then he says krishna i don't want to see this fog and why it's a wonderful fog see it <laughs> so like that the krishna has a little fun at arjuna's expense over here so we'll see what he says over here so he describes what does he see he sees actually the warriors on that very battle अमीचतां धृतराष्ट्रस्य पुत्रः अमीचतां धृतराष्ट्रस्य पुत्रः सर्वे सहैवा मनिपाल संघै सर्वे सहैवा मनिपाल संघै भीष्मो द्रोण सूत पुत्रस्य तथासौ भीष्मो द्रोण सूत पुत्रस्य तथासौ ंडर्स <laughs> of the kaurava army is they are also entering over here and yo the mukhe all of them are entering into the mountain and then he is describing it's, it's a ghastly thing see it's like if you see anyone die it's a scary thing i you know if somebody die in a hospital it's not peaceful i think it's peaceful people just there's some violence that violent shaking of the body that he has it's very rare person dies in peaceful but if we see somebody Say so just we are walking along the road. Somebody is hit by a car, and the person body just flies apart, and then then they or somebody you see a bomb exploding. You know, I see in movies, it's very ghastly. But you know, among the most ghastly ways, what you can see a person dying is you know somebody being eaten by an animal. You know, so you see the lion, the full person is there at one moment, ah, like that person is caught, and they are being ripped apart, and they are being. It's the most scary vision. So here, what is happening is, he's saying that all of them, it's very scary. Vakrani te paramana vishanti. Vakrani te paramana vishanti. So vishanti is their entry. Vakrani is your mouth. Damshra karala ni bhaya nakani. Damshra karala ni bhaya nakani. So they're just entering into your mouth. and your mouth is bordered by all these deadly teeth and as they are entering ke chit bilagna dashna andareshu ke chit bilagna dashna andareshu so it is while they are entering it's almost like a, some irresistible force is drawing them inwards and as they are entering they are colliding against your teeth and they collide against your teeth what happens sandrishyante churitai ut tamangai sandrishyante churitai tamangai so churitai means smashed uttamangai anga is the body uttamangai is the best part of the body which is the best part head so their head is just being smashed apart so you know this is there's a figure of speech in english i forget it like the language is very sweet but the message is ghastly <laughs> So you just hear this word being cited. So drushante churi theru tamangi. Nice sweet words, isn't it? <laughs> But if you actually, what is going on here? But this is indeed a scary vision. 
In fact, some of you may know that uh, maybe about eight, ten years ago, in Russia, they had banned the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Actually, they had not banned the Bhagavad Gita. They had specifically banned the Bhagavad Gita as it is. But fortunately for us, the news India media spread that they were going to end the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and then the Indian parliament was uproar, in the UP parliament was uproar, and the Russian government tried to clarify. It's only one version of the Bhagavad Gita that we have banned. But, but the uproar was so much that they retracted the ban. But at that time, one of the arguments they gave, this was plotted by the Russian Orthodox Church. Hmm? The church has, church was originally one church, it split into two from Europe, there was the Catholic Church. And then Russia was the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, the Orthodox Church basically, and then the ROC then. And after that, the Catholic Church split into two, the Catholic and the Protestants. But in the Russian Orthodox Church, they saw that the Hare Krishna cult is pretty very fast after the fall of communism, and they pursued it as a threat. And they tried to portray that you know, these Hare Krishnas are barbaric people. You know, barbaric? Barbaric means they are savage people, they are wild people. Now, what is the utterly in school? Isn't it? So, what was their argument? They said they worship a barbaric god and they quoted this section of the Bhagavad Gita that they worship a god who eats human beings. <laughs> so, they, they, this is as, this is a, the technical word for this is cannibalism. The carnivorous is those who eat flesh, cannibals are those who eat human flesh. So they said this is a this is a cannibalistic god and our Russian culture is a, is a glorious and pure culture. Uh, we should not let it be contaminated by such a dark and devilish doctrines and therefore it should be banned. So now uh, is the what is going on over here? First of all, this is a vision and the vision even terrifies Arjuna. You know? There is no ritual where the Vishwaru is actually offered universal, offered bodies like that. But what is Krishna trying to show? So after this come two verses. But we we'll look at those verses. But before this, the point is that I said earlier that Krishna will, Krishna is going to show something more to Arjuna. So what is that more? That is what Krishna will be needing to say. That now when Arjuna sees this, I just become scared, alarmed. So I don't know what is going on. And then he just can't make sense of it. So when he can't make sense of it, he decides to ask. So he asks, who are you? Hmm? Not only as if that is not bad enough, that the head is being smashed apart. But then, when the head smashes apart, the blood is, is sprinkling, spreading all over the mouth. And the universal form is taking out its tongue uh, and licking all the blood. Lelia say. So Lelia says, Grasamana Samantar. So Lelia says to lick. <laughs> so so it's, it's truly a scary thing. And even Arjuna becomes scared. So then Arjuna asks that meko bhavanu rupo. I'm asking you, Bhavan, you oh, who who is this universe? Who is this fierce form? He said, Namos to te de Bhavara Prasida. He said, I offer my obeisances to you. What up, Prasida? He says, Vigyatu Vichami Bhavan Tamadyam. So I want to know now, Vigyatu. First of all, I want to know who you are. And second thing, Nahi Prajana Mitava Pravrittim. Tava Pravritti. Pravritti means your inclination, your intention, your mission. Say, so who are you and what are you doing here? You know, some big angry person comes into our home and starts destroying everything. Hey, who are you? What, what are you looking for? So he asked like this. So now here, see, Arjuna, even when he has surrendered to Krishna earlier, and he, he says, Purchami Tom Dharma Samrur At that time also, Arjuna says to Krishna, he is using the word Tom. Tom is two in Hindi. Uh, if you consider, but here suppose you know we are relaxing on a weekend 
and a phone comes and you pick up the phone, call it to and find his our boss. I can you do for you? So the two becomes A. Like that, when Krishna Arjuna sees the universal form, the Twam becomes Bhavan. <laughs> no, it's scary. I want to know who you are and I want to know what is your wishes. So now, why is he asking this? See, what has happened is, he has already identified that this is the universal form. And he's not asking Krishna, who is that? Because Krishna is not there at all. He's asking that, that whatever it is, who are you? So now he has identified in the universal form. But what Krishna has said, I want to show you something more. So what Krishna did is, Krishna's main concern is what, what Arjuna does on the battlefield. What action does he choose? So Krishna is going to give Arjuna a vision in which what happens is that he is showing the universal form. But within the universal form, a major vision is the Kala Rupa. So most of the times, basically the universe has two broad features. There is space and there is time. Now Einstein tried to envision that as a continuum of space-time. But uh, there is space and time. So normally, most of the universal forms the previous universal forms, they show Krishna's, Arjuna spread, uh, sorry, the Krishna spread across space. But this universal form, it shows across space and across time. So basically, he is giving him a vision of what is going to happen in the future. And by giving him a vision of what is going to happen in the future, he is revealing. Later on he will say that Arjuna, whether you fight or don't fight, all these warriors are going to die. But then it is for you to decide whether you want to fight or whether you don't want to fight. If you fight, you will get the glory. If you don't fight, you will miss the glory. So the so earlier Krishna said, you remember Ma, we, today morning we discussed, Ma, Ma, Ma karma for the to report. Do not think that your actions are producing the results. By a higher plan, because of their own misdeeds, all the warriors there are going to die. Mm -hmm. Now, you can become my instrument or you can choose not to become my instrument. So this Kala Rupa Krishna shows extra to show Arjuna that his choice is not going to determine whether the war happens or not. Whether death happens or not. His choice is only going to determine whether he will be a part of the Lord's plan or he won't be a part of it. That's why the, so this is how Krishna expertly connects subject of the universal form with the with the uh, topic of discussion. Now coming to the point of uh, why is this form so brutal? See, there is a important understanding, and this comes in theology, that if God is the source of everything, then that means ultimately the source of the good and the bad in the world. That the good is, for example, creation in the world. So when a new child, when a child is born, there is celebration, there is joy. So God is the source of creation, but then destruction is considered bad in this world. But God is the source of the destruction also. So if we consider God to be disconnected from the bad in the world, now, exactly whether God is the cause of the bad things, specifically that we'll be discussing later, probably when we discuss the ninth chapter, we'll discuss that. But the key point is that nothing is outside of God's jurisdiction. Even the bad things that happen. So the world can be a ugly and brutal place at times. And here, by showing this almost naked vision, of the costly nature of reality, the Gita is telling, showing us that this is what the world can become. And sometimes what happens, people can go through life uh, and okay, the world is not so bad, I'm not so bad, God is good, everything is fine. But you know, when people are not exposed to the ghastliness of the world, the brutality of the world, and when they face the brutality, 
tell you, it's just it's very difficult for them to even come to terms with it. Many times nowadays people have trauma. Now, if you consider life is life was far tougher in the past than it is now. At least not in the distant past of Satyuga, you know, but a few hundred years ago. Life is much more comfortable. But why are people so traumatized? Because the trauma is because people are in one sense um, anesthetized to distress, anesthetized to horror. So that's why when they see something horrible happening, they, just, they don't have a they don't have a worldview, they don't have the intellectual resources, they don't have the spiritual resources. How can this be happening? How can this be happening to me? So here the Gita offers us that this is, this is the issue of the world. The world can be dreadful also. Now that doesn't mean that the world will always be dreadful like that. That doesn't mean that everybody will face such dreadful things. But the dreadfulness of the world is also a part of the reality. And when we see, now what is happening here, I will make this key point over here. So this is, we could say, the Lord's mission. Now, Arjuna has asked two questions. Who are you and what is your mission? Tava Prabhu. So, that's when Krishna answers the question specifically. He doesn't say, hey, I am Krishna, your friend. I am the Vishwarupa. Who does he say I am? I am Kala. Kala is me. So, the Lord is Kala and his mission is? Lokakshakrut Prabhu, destruction. Now Kala can do creation, Kala can do maintenance, these all three phases are of Kala only, but the destruction is happening over here. So it's like say we are going for, we have met an old friend after 15 years and we are going for a walk and while we are going for a walk suddenly a half a dozen thugs attack us and our friend suddenly ex ex exhibits some karate moves and within 5 minutes all those thugs are flat on the ground. We may turn to ask, who are you? So now, like that, Arjuna is asking, who are you? So that, that person says, oh, I am your friend. And that's not the question. It's like we are seeing something unknown within the notes. Then say, oh, you know, I have a, I have a karate training, I have a black belt. Oh, okay. So the specific attribute that Arjuna is asking about, Kalos Yoga Check. That's the answer. So, now within the Lord's mission, we can be a part. Maybe the Lord is wanting something to happen and we can be a part. Or we can be a part. <laughs> now the choice is up to us. So Arjuna can be a part of the Lord's plan for destroying the evil elements in the world. Or he can be a part of, or he can just stand apart from it and then he will miss the Lord. So that's his choice. And there's a lot more in this chapter, but I'll just make two quick points. See, one point before we go ahead. See, in the vision itself, I'm going to say that, is everyone in that battlefield a bad person? Is everybody, does everybody deserve this brutal destruction? So there itself, Arjuna gives two distinct visions. Arjuna has two distinct visions of how people are dying. So one of them is of water entering into an ocean and the other is of moth entering into fire yathana dinam bahoam vega samudra meva vimukha dravanti so the acharya is explained this refers to people like bhishma and drona hmm? they didn't want to they, did, they didn't want the war but just by the force of the situation they are propelled into the war but the moth entering the fire they are like duryodhana Duryodhana, Karana, they, they incited the Pandavas, they sought the war. Now there is one more significance now, in the Sri Vaishnava tradition, Ramacharya is a prominent commentator, prominent commentator. Under him, one of his prominent followers is Vedanta Rishika. So in his Bhagavad, in his, in his Bhagavad sub-commentary, he says that this is not just so, this is like involuntary, Involuntary means they didn't want to do it. This is intention. The moth is going towards the fire. Mm -hmm. But there is another bigger difference. That is, when the moth goes to the fire, it is just destructive. The moth rushes towards the fire, the moth going to the fire, the fire doesn't benefit anyone. It doesn't even benefit the moth. 
and ultimately the water mouth just dies. But the water going towards the ocean is constructive. How is it constructive? The water, while it is going towards the ocean, it irrigates the land around it. It provides water to thousands and thousands of life forms, plants, animals, human beings along the way. So similarly, you know, for all of us, if Krishna is the ocean, we are all at every moment we are in the water going towards the ocean. But while we are going toward the ocean, our goal is not just to go toward the ocean. Our goal is also to provide water to others as we go toward the ocean. So a devotee, sometimes people feel that no, you just are concerned with your own liberation, you're not concerned with the world. If we had not been concerned about the world, then why would we be trying to share Krishna Bhakti with others? We could just live in some Vrindavan or some Himalaya somewhere and we could peacefully practice our Bhakti without distraction. So every one of us is like say, this is the mountain and this is the ocean. The wonderful thing about life is that actually it's not that everyone has one path towards the ocean. You know, everyone has their individual path towards the ocean. And each one of us can benefit different people as we knew we are going on our path towards the ocean. After this, when Arjuna understands that this is Krishna and this is Krishna's plan, and this is Kala Rupa, this is Krishna Rupa, Arjuna offers prayers to Krishna. It's the only section in the Gita from 36 to 46. Arjuna offers prayers. And then he says, he doesn't realize that this Krishna is actually God. He is just Vishwarupa. He says that earlier, I just feel you, I made fun of you. Sakheti matwa prasamamya dukta. Like I just mocked you, I made some fun of you sometimes. Hey, you know, you are very strong. Sometimes we would go for a war and I would actually kill the enemy. And then when you would come back, Krishna, you are so strong. You know, actually I had killed, so I was having fun at your expense. <laughs> Please forgive me, I had fun like that. You know, just as the father forgives the son, the other a friend forgives a friend, or just as the lover forgives the beloved. Please, come on. And then he says, Please, show me your. I have seen the Ugra Rupa, this is enough now, show me your. So, how it works is, there is the, there is the two handed form. Now, from the two handed form, the universal form is shown. Now, this is what Arjuna requests. Now, from the universal form, there is the, uh, Krishna briefly shows the four-handed form. <coughs> and from the four-handed form, he comes back to the two-handed form. And Krishna says that this form is rare. Seeing the universal form is rare, but seeing the two-handed form, is rarer still. And he says, Deva Aptyasya Rupasya Nityam Darshana Kaunshina. In the Devdas are long, you can see this form. And the most significant part, so this is the sequence I want to say that Arjuna offers, Arjuna offers prayers from 36 to 46. He offers prayers to this form. But then at the end, after all this ghastly form has been shown, all the destruction has been shown. But what does Krishna conclude on this verse with? He, the first, last verse in the 1155. And the first thing he says, he says, Mat, mat karma krun mat parmo mat bhakta sangha varjita nirvaira sarva bhuteshu yaha samameti pandava. So he says, one key word here is nirvaira. What is the meaning of Vaira? Do you know? Enmity. So Vairi is enemy. Nirvairaha means with no enmity towards anyone. So now Arjuna could have asked Krishna, so earlier 11.33 you said, yeah, you are, Krishna tells Arjuna, your enemies are killed by my arrangement. And now you are saying have no enemies. So what is going on? So Krishna is saying, <coughs> Your enemies are killed. But then have no enmity towards anyone. <coughs> so this reveals actually the depth of the Gita. See, the point is functionally there are people who are opposed to dharma, 
there are people who are uh, doing terrible things and they have to be stopped functionally arjuna may have to treat some people as enemies and he have to fight against them but fundamentally we understand that everybody is a part of the lord and therefore there is to be no enmity towards anyone so it's more like the key theme of the bhagavad gita is arjuna fights but the fight should not be for revenge the fight is for justice the fight is for dharma so it is like take the personal emotion out of the equation now they hurt me in such a way therefore i'll fight against them i'll kill them or don't have that in mind it is there is a higher plan going on and as a part of that higher plan you act so no personal emotion in the equation and throughout the gita this is the mood of arjuna that that you know you don't fight or you don't do anything because it's your personal agenda there is a higher plan of the lord and you have the opportunity to be a part of the plan of the lord so once we bring our personal emotion in then what happens is then our biases come in then our likes and dislikes come in and then we can't move forward very steadily so if we have to have a service attitude then the primary thing is we see that this person is actually a part of the group and how can i serve so you know i, I saw a cartoon it says you know that the person with ego and a person with humility the person with humility as well as someone how can i serve you as a person with ego how can you serve me <laughs> so we will not say that hello how can you serve me we may never say that but for a person with ego that is the idea oh, okay and now of course we may say if we are in authority position we are engaging others in service but it's not just our service it's actually it's the lord's service and as a part of that service we are also doing some things so in that sense uh, but the mood is that we try to engage we are all a part of krishna service. so we try to take the personal out nirvaira sarva bhuteshu so although the chapter depicts a quite a bit of violence but the end is strikingly non violent in one sense not is it non violent but it is actually non non personal it is no have no personal agenda it is not a justification of violence this is avoid the enemy so you are fighting not to get even with me so they are fighting see here it is like you are fighting here the fight is here but your purpose is this is our destination we are fighting not to defeat the other person but we are fighting to attain krishna yaha samam eti pandava a person who acts in this way will come to me so i'll summarize what we discussed today the 11th chapter is also one of the one of the longer chapters 55 verses and it is also one of the most dramatic chapters so we discussed <laughs> we started by how 11.1 is very similar to or rather 11.2 is very similar to 1873 it like the gita is over and then these are supplementary questions that are coming up and arjuna he desires but he does not demand so desiring to show the devotion and demand not demanding show the submission and then what krishna he what he does is expert he is expert so what he does is he brings the tangent and connects it with the core subject he discusses that is expert teacher and then go off on a tangent and then refuse to answer but he connects it back and then we discuss the modality of the revelation the revelation how does it happen is that the three levels first krishna describes then sanjay describes to dhritarashtra and then arjuna describes himself so the idea is that when we use the word see it can refer to vision but it can also refer to comprehension so krishna gives arjuna a special vision by which he can not only see but he can also understand so to help you understand krishna describes further words so 
vision happens with eyes but comprehension happens with intelligence and then we discuss about the universal form as described in the gita is a <coughs> it's a revelation in the bhagavatam it is a conceptualization that it is a different form that is basically a sadhaka sthiti then we discussed so we spent majority of the time that how the emotion of arjuna has two aspects it's it's first awesome it's vismitos me and then it becomes awful it becomes scared so around 15 to 22 is awesome and then after that 23 till around 31 is he sees it scared and then we discussed what is the reason for the scary form the scary form is it is to include or to connect the vision with there is a immediate reason the scala rupa is shown within the universal form so we could show there is a contextual reason contextual reason is that to arjuna's decision to guide him to aid him in his decision that will do you want to fight anyway this war is going to happen but at a philosophical or theological level the understanding is that the evil is also within god within not god in literally god but god's plan god's jurisdiction so the otherwise the brutal things of this world can completely shake our faith and that should not happen and then beyond that the last part we discuss is while this is a the it's a violent revelation where a god says that your enemies will be killed 33 is talking about enemies but the last talks about it's a non personal execution non personal not impersonal non personal means without any personal agenda it is nirvairaha so we all if you have to be a part of be a part and we want to be be a part not we don't want to be a part so what will make us is if we get to we get our personal emotions into it then we will not be able to be a part of the lord's plan so but if we keep a focus on service and not the personal emotions then we can be a part of the lord's plan thank you very much hare krishna we have maybe a one two questions in us so today my question is regarding questions so like what is absolute inquiry and like what is in the learning questions and how to avoid like how to check if i uh, i have any question is an absolute or not well um if we have a question it's always better to ask at the same time we have to also look at the nature of the speaker and then decide which questions to ask him because some people are more analytical some people are more spontaneous some people are more more uh, devotional so then what happens is if we do not understand the nature of the speaker then we may ask a question and they may not enter in the question so i wouldn't worry too much about what is absurd or irrelevant any question that comes to our mind if it is it, it is a question that is uh, concerning us that we must to ask it. but before we ask the question to someone now else we first ask ourselves is this the right person to ask the question because as i said if that person and we need like minded association so especially when you are going to ask questions we need to have like minded people like minded means like minded association or like minded guides so what does like minded guide mean it broadly means that first thing is we understand their mind that means when they give classes the class makes sense uh, sometimes some people give classes and yeah it's all nice class but the way they explain it this is linked with us it doesn't make sense to us we understand their mind then they understand our mind 
that means if we ask a question and they don't even judge us i don't say oh you know you are in my early days i used to have a lot of questions <laughs> and i used to ask everyone questions after some time i realized i should not do that <laughs> but there's one devotee i asked a question and he says chaitanya charan i think you have forgotten that we are in the bhakti mara not the gyan mara <laughs> so, I felt a little confused. I felt a little discouraged. But you know, over a period of time, I decided with all due respects, whatever mark I am on, my Prashna mark is never going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so they understand our mind. Third is they help us understand our mind. Okay, you are thinking in this way, and this is where your thinking is right, but this is where you are missing something in your thinking. But if they just judge us and put us in label us and put us into a box, that's not very really helpful. So now going beyond that, what is irrelevant inquiry? That means if a particular topic is going on, and they ask a completely different question, <coughs> say that. Uh, In the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, there is an example of Kurma Angani was Sarvasha. The tortoise withdraws limbs into the body, and like that, we should withdraw our senses into our body. So now, if somebody says, you know, this reminds me of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taking the Kurma Rupa. Well, okay, but there is what nothing to do with the subject, isn't it? Just because the word Kurma comes over there, you know, that is a devotional ecstasy. This is a, a metaphor for self-discipline. It's completely different. So, if something is utterly unconnected, then maybe that's not the best thing to talk at that particular. Now, absurd inquiry. I feel absurd is a bit of a uh, subject to judgment. Like, who will consider what to be absurd? But. If he has some question, then we should always ask them to the right people, and then we seek the answers. So like, say, you know, this question when Kamsa was concerned about the eighth child, then uh, why did he not just keep also they were devotees in separate chambers? Why did he keep them together? <laughs> Now this is a question that has been asked different people, and different people ask different answer differently. You know, I heard different answers. One answer was that you know, Kamsa did not have engineering brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way of answering it. But then I look at the Acharya's commentaries. What comes out from there is, see, Kamsa was on a power, ego trip or a power trip. He had already defeated the Devas, and when he got to Akashwani. That Akashwani had clearly come from the Devatas only. So now, what he wanted to do was, if I can prove that Akashwani falls, then what will happen is the Devatas all credibility will be lost. There are many demons who have defeated the Devatas, but no demon has falsified the Akashwani of the Devatas. If I can do that, I'll be the greatest. That's why his mood was: let the child be born, then I'll kill the child. That's why he let the parent, let Vasudeva and Devaki stay together. Now that was why Vasudeva and Devaki were allowed to be together. Why comes? Some people might consider it to be an absurd question. So I would say it's absurd subject, subject to judgment. So that's why if they don't understand our mind, they they bring a particular question as absurd. They don't ask the question in that particular way. Yes, sir. Uh, you mention that Arjun got a divination from uh, uh, Krishna yeah. to see uh, the Vishnu, but uh, how the Sanjay saw it, and are the other warriors on the battlefield able to see it? And well, surely Duryodhan didn't see himself going to the mouth of the Kalarupa. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly, I, um, there's no description of anybody else seeing it. Nobody was impacted in any way. Now Sanjay was given a special vision to describe what was happening on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. 
so all that is relevant um, for the narration to be there sanjay had the vision for that that sanjay is a, a, toward the end of the gita sanjay will also express special gratitude that i got to see this universal form this special form i got that roop mahat this special form i got to see so i would say that is also we ask devs mercy that whatever was relevant on the battlefield that was to be what that he got to see uh, was the time standard for the like an arjuna well, before durya before as long as bhishma was the commander uh, more or less everybody followed the ethics so when krishna when arjuna arjuna came in the middle of the battlefield and he started talking all the conscious had been blown bhishma raised his hand bhishma said stop and everybody stopped and that was not the only incident when after the gita was spoken then yudhishthir got down from his chariot and he started walking towards the kauravas and then also yudhishthir said stop so then this one of the kauravas were laughing they said he is coming to surrender to us but yudhishthir went to the kaurava side to seek the blessing of the elders so the although it was a war it was like a sports so they didn't want to just uh, opportunistically win by attacking the enemy when that time is not watching they wanted to, at least initially they wanted to win by being superior in skill and strength so when they saw the two of them were talking they stopped yes uh, prabhuji in the middle of the lecture uh, you have explained that uh, 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 krishna told us you know that be a part of my plan or be a part from my plan so uh, arjuna like fearfully like got convinced that by seeing the vishwarupa he that i have to follow krishna what he whatever he says but in our lives uh, we tend to give our plans more priority than thinking that there is something much higher with krishna plan also there so how can we understand because vishwarupa is not there it is to well i'm not sure whether it was fear that led to arjuna's compliance because arjuna has already said that i accept your super reality arjuna has already said that uh, my illusion is gone so and and that karishya vachanam tava that he says is at the end of the gita that's almost six more chapters away so it was did this play a part in arjuna's decision surely it played a part in the decision but even after seeing this If Arjuna had been just just been scared into obedience, and, you know he could have said, you know, this is such a deadly form. I don't want to mess with it. No more questions. Just let's do what it is. But he asked questions for almost one third of the Gita, you know, six more chapters. So I don't think fear played any part in Arjuna's decision. Or you can say it's a fear is more like a healthy fear. It's not a terror. It's like mad bhayad vati vatoyam. So it's a healthy fear of one's authorities is good, but that. fear was not the main factor because arjuna's metaphors are also when he even when he is addressing the vishwarupa the metaphors are centered on affection like a, a father forgives his son or a, a friend forgives his friend or a lover forgives his beloved like that so all the metaphors are very affection centered so i don't think that's a factor at all and now as far as our plans concerned this we will talk more in the 18th chapter in the time but it's not that our plan and krishna's plan always has to be at cross purposes in many ways you could say our deepest desires are actually krishna's desires manifesting through us we all have certain desires you know i want to eat this food i want to watch this i want this people to admire me but those desires come and go but the deepest desire that we have so they are usual desires according to our swabhav If Krishna has given us somebody singing ability, Krishna has given somebody speaking ability, then the desire to do something according to that ability that is actually Krishna's desire for us. So Krishna's plan is not necessarily at cross purposes with our plan. In fact, you could say uh, it's like uh, desire is like a multi-level thing. Now there are surface desires here, yeah. and there are deep desires. So often our surface desires, they will they will be uh, often opposed to Krishna's or different from Krishna's plan. 
but what happens is the deeper desires within us they are actually in harmony with krishna's plan see ultimately our desiring power has been given to us by krishna so while krishna gave us a power that is only going to take us away from him. if krishna wants our love that means he doesn't just want uh, want our obedience he wants us to desire him so our deepest desires they come from krishna and they want to take us to krishna so that's why as we become purified then we start going beyond the surface desires to the deeper desires within us and then that uh, one who works with the deepest according to deepest desire that is that is how that person will work according to krishna's plan so initially while we are not aware of our deeper desires we follow our spiritual master and then we learn from our spiritual master from our spiritual authority spiritual guides what we should do and Prabhupada went to America that was, his, that was what his spiritual master wanted him to do but then around 1970s Prabhupada came back to India and mostly based himself in India and he said that my spiritual master told me to speak in the West to preach in the West I have done that now it is my desire to preach in India and you help me with it and Prabhupada it is my desire that is not independent of his Guru's desire but more that uh, like a uttam bhakta, like a best high quality servant. That person uh, doesn't just follow the literal word of the, the, the authority, but also understand the mood, the intent. So Prabhupada realized that preaching in the West was wonderful, but uh, ultimately the mission was to be sustained for a long time. It needed a foundation in India. That's why Prabhupada spent time in India to build that foundation. Thank you, Thank you very much. Simon Bhagavad Gita ki. Shri Prabhupada ki. Kaur Bhattar ki.